uh, which is dealing with labor, uh, Narega, many issues, and we have the highlight of this day-long program is a seminar um, by Dr. Hans Kinswanger, um, who um, we have named the principal advisor of the of many, but primarily on our mission and village dynamics studies in South Asia. Um, if you talk about anything about the village level studies or about anything about rural development, Hans has something to say about it. Uh, to a great deep extent on his favorite topics, especially on risk and uncertainty. But that has gone beyond risk and uncertainty. Insights on the villages and even insights on faraway topics, uh, which was far away before, like climate change, labor, land tenure issues, and anything under the sun that talks about rural development, not only in the seminar tropics, but it encompasses the rural development transformation process happening in Africa, in South Asia, and he's undertaking some good studies right now, very comprehensive ones that even includes China. Um, I would say, dare say about Latin America to, to, to do that too, um, but I would look la at Hans as the guru, not only of the students around him, but all of these rural development experts who have become rural experts, you know, uh, around the world. Um, since 1975, when they started the VLS, that was start essentially of a career um, that has been very fruitful and very meaningful because it had to do with world development and soon after the um, ICRISAT mission as village level studies, um, one of the main pioneers uh, who went to Yale for some time and then went to World Bank where he stayed until he retired. I thought upon his retirement, he'll settle in Zimbabwe, where I was at the time. Uh, but he then settled in neighboring uh, South Africa, Victoria. And I thought he'd retire and start to enjoy life as a retiree. But he did more than that. He moved beyond what ex our expectations of going beyond his concerns, which at that time was Africa, as I would call you as the chief of Afri Africa Bureau of the World Bank, um, uh, dealing with issues um, primarily on health, primarily in HIV AIDS, health and nutrition. Uh, but um, when we commence, start commencing the Village Le Level Studies mission in 1999, um, the work has been underway with him. Um, spearheading new areas of research. And you will find that if you look at the literature right now, his areas of interest has expanded. And the new areas of concern includes this, asking how can Indian agriculture uh, cope with rising wages. But it will link with many of the other issues, not only within India, but also Africa and China. And the work that he has started to spearhead with respect to thinking process about integrating of these issues on resources as well as long-term resources like climate change. Now all of these under a big umbrella in his big mind uh, will be shared with us in one hour today uh, through a seminar which actually is a very good result that has come up of his um, recent studies especially on the analysis of the measures of certain variables, you know, and he's looked at fixed and quasi factors to the wage and other prices in using the panel data. This will not be talking about VLS. It will be talking about a similar data for which will supposed to encourage us and stimulate us 
on how we can also use our panel data like the VLS. And Hans is asking the question, why and how can Indian agriculture cope with rising wages? Now this is stimulated by um, initial results also, I should say, that when we started bringing out certain results regarding wages, you can see the stagnation of wages from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up to the early 2000s. And but these wages have risen and almost you can see exponentially, like a step function or exponentially. And how did Indian agriculture and how is Indian agriculture coping with it? Now Hans has some answers which he will be sharing with us this afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. I can see we're almost uh, uh, running out of uh, space right now. Uh, I, I would like to um, thank Stein for being here and thank uh, the others. Uh, I, I was told that others will be coming over. They are on meetings. I just came from the same meeting and uh, they'll be joining us. May, may I invite you now, Hans? Yes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure again to talk to you and I would like to particularly welcome Stain B, our former board chairman and guiding light, and who is now sitting in his own building. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go right into the matter. Okay, what is the questions? We have had rapid economic growth, rising real rural wages, declining farm sizes, and all of that should have put the squeeze on profits, isn't it? So, but when profits fall, farmers typically reduce their output supply, isn't it? They should. So, we're rightfully concerned about what's happening to aggregate food supply. And uh, what do farmers do to maintain food supply growth in the face of rising wages? And then the second question is, can government do what Norway did and Switzerland and all of us in the developed world by compensating farmers for rising wages by rising prices? And this is what the OECD countries did during their golden age from the 1950s onwards, long past and leaving a monumental mess behind in the agricultural trade system of the world. No, in the trade system period. So now that we know, Cynthia, the bad news is that uh, wages are rising but the really rapid exponential trend is a little bit associated with inflation. If you take out inflation, you still have some quite extraordinary story. You first have a decade of rapid growth of wages at 3.7% per annum, which seemingly went by unnoticed at the time. And then they fell from up to about 2006 and 7, and then started rising rapidly again. And the, the, and they grew at the, the fastest since 2006, 7 at 6.7%. So now, what is the agricultural productivity trend? In the 80s, agriculture grew at 3.3 percent and it was supported by an equal increase in total factor productivity. Both fell quite significantly in the 1990s and started to recover only in the 2000 and 2000, uh, in the 2000s. What this decade-wide uh, average is growth rates hide is that from about 1999 to 2005 or 6, Indian agriculture went through a crisis 
with a rapid slowdown of the growth rate, with low prices still persisting, and uh, 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 and I will show later what that crisis has meant. But now we're out of the crisis, and the good news is that growth actually in the last few years I think has accelerated to go over three percent. And so has total factor productivity. Now the question is, if wages went up so rapidly, how could uh, uh, growth accelerate? And there are two possibilities. Uh, if wages rise, they have very little impact on aggregate uh, um, supply, which means that uh, supply elasticity of wages with respect to output is very low. And that means that, yeah, that elasticity with respect to wages is low in absolute terms. The second hypothesis is you now the wages have increased and have a large impact on aggregate crop output, but these are compensated by accelerating growth in other factors prices, in farmer investment in land and non-land assets, adoption of new technology, and then government supply shift such as um, such as uh, infrastructure education improved markets. In order to therefore answer the question, we need to estimate an aggregate output supply factor demand systems which can handle all of these things. So, this output supply factor demand system is loosely structured based on the variable profit function model. Output and vari it distinguishes between output and variable factors who can respond from year to year to big changes. You can always produce less if prices come down or you can hire less labor. And we are estimating what these fact, the output and the factors of production do with respect to output weight, the crop, with respect to wages of hired labor, non-farm and fertilizer prices. Crop prices, not wages, sorry. Then we have a set of fixed factor or quasi-fixed factor. They're not really fixed in the long term. And they are how much labor force the household has, uh, how much land, and how much non-land capital, okay? animals and machines, etc. Okay? So these can adjust a little slower, but they can also adjust. That's why in the end we had to treat them as endogenous variables. And then we have some shifters, the number of characters and rate of adoption of HYV. We couldn't really find other shifters uh, such as row density and things like that, but this can be done, I hope, by Lamani using our district database. Now we're using the survey, uh, Nancy AR, Aris survey, And this started in 204 villages from 17 states in 1969 and kept interviewing exactly the same households and the latest round is now underway. Not only did they follow a household, they followed each split of household. So Stain has three children and so they followed the entire dynasty of Stain. And that's what we do in the DSA too. So we have uh, we have all this data which you are familiar with from the VDSA. They're pretty much the same, but they have some other data too. So now, what happened? We look at the year between 1999 to 2007-8. That's when the rounds were. And we see that household size has come down at the rate of 2.23%. But household size per owned area 
has actually gone up. Okay, and that's because we continue to have overpopulation growth. The education of the heads of the households and the workforce have sharply increased. Workers per own acres. That's the workforce, that's not the household size, have also increased, but how many are deployed in agriculture have decreased, while those going to the non-agricultural sector have increased. And you can see here already a systematic shift of the labor force out of agriculture into the non-farm sector. So now the question comes, if that's happening, shouldn't it make it even more difficult? Land loan per household went down quite significantly. The non-land assets grew very rapidly. That's a very rapid, it grew faster than anything else. Then we had a significant factorization and some adoption of HYV. Remember, HYVs are practically at 100% or very close to, so the rates of adoption are now quite low. <sighs> So we have household size declining, again labor use still increasing, the labor force shifting to the non-farm sector and to education, I didn't show you that, very big increase in people educated, very significant growth occurred in the non-land agricultural assets in irrigation and tractors. Okay, so that's the story which we have. This is an all India story. It's a national, it, the sample was nationally representative in 1999, and of course it's no longer representative. Now, output grew at a relatively slow rate of 1.17. That's because we cover precisely that period when agriculture was a little bit in crisis. Then we have a sharp rate of uh, increase in production costs, which mean that there was a profit squeeze, and it was quite significant. Prices grew, uh, hired labor grew very much, but also despite the fact that people shifted from agriculture to non-agriculture, they also increased their input of family labor. Then we have a uh, modest growth in the agriculture world, and the sharp growth in the non-agricultural range. And so these are some other uh, things which were. Despite all these adverse trends, we have total per capita income growing at nearly 9%. Now what about, so this is the story, slow growth, 1.3, sorry for that mistake. And uh, higher labor increased more rapidly than family labor. Much more rapidly, okay? So something is going on here which is quite interesting. Why should higher labor go up when wages go up, okay? So now we have some econometric issues. First we have unobservable variables which are in individual specific ability, village, uh, soil fertility, etc., etc. And the classic way of dealing with this is to have calculate the difference is between the households and there we only use the variations within each household and obviously the village stays the same and the ability stays the same, so we clean them out. Then we have another problem that uh, some of the explanatory volumes are endogenous. And here specifically, if we increase the price or the wage, uh, it will both increase output but also the investments in land, non-land assets. So, so therefore we can't do the direct regressions and what we had to do is we predict all the quasi-fixed factors. You see, uh, where is he? Martin, that's what you have to do. 
so we, we choose an instrumental variable to do that and the condition of that for those who are not economists is that uh, uh, that for example to predict wealth we cannot we, we use the wealth inherited in the past or for family labor force we use the urban weights to predict what they get and once you have done that what you have eliminated is the correlation between the error term of the regression with the right hand side variables and you're back to a normal distribution assumption so now let's see what did farmers do with respect to the quasi-fixed factors not much happened here but in non-land assets there was a very good response of the assets with respect to the uh, to with respect to uh, uh, the output price and also when the non-agricultural wage rose it had a very strong impact on reducing uh, 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 reducing uh, aggregate output and why is that because the labor is moving from agriculture to non-agriculture and has more or less time for doing it and the urban wage has an influence but it's not that large because uh, there are not that many employment opportunities and the rest of the things are, are, are not that interesting or not that relevant right here so we take the non-price land assets respond by the same absolute way then the prices to rises in non-farm wages so suppose you wanted to compensate for the wage rate rise by raising prices so that they can keep the capital stocks the same for every 10 percent increase in the wage you would also have to raise the prices by 10 percent and that's obviously not quite feasible okay you're going to quickly run into trouble uh, taking everything away from the workers who just got the price increase then urban wages induces a limited re uh, reduction in the family labor force and rising prices of non-farm assets has a very large impact on uh, uh, on reducing investment so investments are very price elastic compared to everything else in the system turns out that uh, yeah I'll show that now here we go to the output supply equation and here we have an output in, with respect to price increases by 0.233 percent which is remarkably similar to what I estimated 25 years ago with the district data. but here comes the bad news okay of the 0.233 it the, the increased wage if it goes up by the same time then you eat up all of that output price change so if wages rise at the same rate as output prices you got nothing left okay? and these are quite large elasticities we also see that uh, hired labor, family labor, and fertilizer respond strongly to output prices and strongly to the input prices, similar to constraints and everything else. Here, because I'm talking about, uh, no, let me not do that because I'm, that's a distraction. So, the farm and non farm wage decrease output velocities of 0.14 so again what you have is that it will not be possible to compensate for higher wages via higher output prices you couldn't possibly have real output prices go up by six seven percent when the wages rise by ten percent okay so uh, and it is the family labor force which has the highest impact on output okay if you look at this if you look at among the fixed quasi fixed factors the predicted labor force 
has a massive impact on output. So when I first looked at that, I was very puzzled. Why would that be? And it turns out that we see later, it is because the family labor force, we saw that education went up by more than a year. So the family labor embodies capital and that and this response is actually both to the raw labor and the human capital. Then there is a more subtle factor, which is that if your family members, if you have, uh, if you have a bigger labor force, and all of this is per acre, remember, then the number of people are going to go outside and make some earnings. What does that do to your capital constraint or to your cash constraint? It reduces your cash constraint. So that this is so large means that credit constraints are binding in Indian agriculture, which is consistent with much of the results in the rest of the literature. So now, how... <coughs> did the farmers do and what we do is we list these elasticities. Now these are the medium term elasticities, not the ones which you saw because they take into account of what happens to the quasi fixed factors and what happens to the variable factors when the price changes. Here we have the growth rate between these two periods of the factors and when we multiply it together we get the contribution of each factors to agricultural cost. Okay? So we see that uh, we see that uh, the uh, output price, no, let's go over it. We see that non land assets had the biggest impact because they grew so fast, not because they had the highest elasticity. Okay? Labor has a much higher elasticity, but it grows slowly, but it still added 0.81%. Now we have to look at what happens when all wages rise, rural, urban, uh, agriculture, non-agriculture, and urban. That, that then leads to an elasticity of... Uh, Okay. All wages have an elasticity of minus 0.18, so you get a hit in your growth rate of close to 1%. That's a huge hit. Okay? But we see that that hit was offset just by the increase in the labor force. And then it left something on top of it, the 1.21% which is the increase in the non land assets, then the prices added something to it, and tractors, villages, uh, HYV, and disembodied technical change added another 30%, 0.3% uh, uh, to the growth. And when we add up all these contributions, we find we actually find that despite the rise in wages, we predict the growth rate of 1.9 which is significantly larger than this, and which may have to do with, uh, with the ups and downs in uh, prices and output, etc. Now my next job is to get all these data. I have the farm wage data, and you see in the 80s, the growth rate would have been reduced by 0.27%. In the in 2008 to 11, the wages grew at the rate, this is only four years, of 10%, and it would have cut, the uh, uh, farm wages alone would have cut the growth rate. If the urban wage had risen as well, the impact would have been something like, uh, 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 something like 2.7 or 2.8%. So the last few years, which you have gone through, had a monumental impact of wages on aggregate output. Yeah, we, didn't, we didn't feel it. Okay. So now the question is, 
what, which of these factors grow sufficiently fast so that they could offset the loss. Okay? And that I haven't done yet, that calculation. But are you, so to summarize again, of all the wages, it is the non-farm wage which had the highest impact on the growth rate. Okay, now see. Most people worry about hired labor when they talk about wages. But it turns out that what is far more important than people, than hired, the demand for hired labor going down, is that the farmers themselves are running out and working in the non-farm sector. Okay? And then they're using, substituting hired workers for part of the work which is lost. So it's a completely different story from what sort of what people normally think. It's the non-farm story, which is about. And the right wage decline would have uh, uh, the two decades and the last few years are very different. And if non-farm had at the same right the in, had, impacts in the last few years would have been even more dramatic, and I think they probably did rise the same way, but I haven't got the data yet. So this is, this is it. So now, so it was, it was the, just to repeat, it was the, the labor force, which, which just compensated for the hit, the non-land assets added this and this, and all these added another three, so the predicted rate is even higher. So, what can we conclude? Farmers coped splendid for the rise. It looks like they almost did it effortly. But then. So now, who gained and lost? There was about the 1.1 rise in real prices during the period. So obviously the consumers lost something. But what, what about the farmers? Far from losing from these rising wages, which is normally what we think about, they gained because they moved from less productive farm work to more productive non-farm work. And they did it both by going for employment outside the farm and by adding rural non-farm enterprises. And of all the farm households at the time of the beginning, 1969, only 9% had a rural non-farm enterprise. But that has now risen to 20%, which is more than doubled in eight years. And the increase in the and, uh, and the amount of income which they go, we have this in another paper, is the fastest component of the rural economy. It's the rural non-farm sector, self employed And then they increase their participation in higher rural non-farm work, and they replace the shift by higher labor who found more farm employment at higher wages. Okay. So that means both the farmers and the workers came. Hallelujah. Okay. Isn't that amazing? The farmers gained from rapidly rising rural wages. And they gained more than the, than the landless laborer, and that's because the landless labor wage rose more slowly. But I would think that they made up for it in the last four years of the period of analysis. Now, what about the future? We had this exceptionally high agricultural wage growth. It's if the farm and the non-farm wages had grown at the same rate, which they probably have, it would have been a hit of 2.5% to the growth rate of agriculture during this year. That seems like it's totally unsustainable, okay? And 
as we go, we have to look at also, uh, we're going to get, we have the wages only to 2011-12, so we have to look what, 2010-11, so we have to look what happened in the last three years. And any compensation for that huge hit would have had to come from technical change. Now we know from uh, Keith Fuglier's work that technical change fortunately accelerated very significantly to do this year. And rising labor force and human capital, of course, that's also still ongoing. Agricultural population is still increasing and will increase into the mid 2020s. And the human capital is also increasing still very rapidly. So we did not, we already know that agriculture did not go down. So it appears that the system was able to cope, okay? even with this huge hit. Okay? Now, conclusions. India can't respond to rising wages by increasing crop prices. Because the rights why a price increases would be far too large. For every 10% of wage rises, you would have to increase output prices by 10%. You can't do that. That would hurt consumers, and this, that would hurt consumers, and especially the poor, including the poor agricultural laborers and the poor farmers. They would bring in, this would also bring in, yeah, into sharp conflict with the WTO. You know, think about it in the next 10 or 15 years, Wages are going to grow by about 100%. You can't raise prices by 100% without hitting the ceiling of your tariff bindings with the WTO. If investment trends in non-land capital, human capital and labor continue, India is likely to cope quite well with relatively high rates of wage growth. I wouldn't recommend 10% per year, but maybe four, or five, six, which is very fast too. It will benefit both the farmers and the landers. But that doesn't mean that the adjustments are painless. Okay? You see, farmers, when confronted with the rising wages, they have to make painful adjustments. They have to invest, they have to they can't find the labor anymore, they're upset, there is political turmoil. And quite interesting, this period of analysis is the period in which farmer suicides increased. And there will be farmers and landless workers who cannot participate in the labor market or not participate enough in the labor market. Uh, for example, there's many landless workers uh, we also know that from other studies, if you're more than 28 years old, 30 years, you can't move from being an agricultural worker to a rural non-farmer. It just isn't. It's young men who move. The young women also have a terrible time moving, so, so it will be tough for the women to, to adjust because they cannot they have a hard time moving to the north. So there is lots of people who are going to be hurt. Okay? And that's why we all have this big political turmoil. What about the future? Now we saw this exceptionally high growth of the wage. We already saw this 2.5% hit. We saw what it would have to be concentrated for. Uh, it, okay, no, I already showed this slide, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I went backwards. Okay. That's it. So I was wondering, uh, in the modeling efforts, uh, where does uh, draft animals appear? Uh, because I didn't see it explicitly in terms of animal power use in, on farms. The second issue uh, that I don't understand quite well is the whole uh, 
crop diversification of agricultural activities to high value crops. So how much of uh, the aggregate output uh, driven by cropping pattern changes rather than just technical efficiency? Okay, on the bullocks we know that they're on their way out, okay? In many places there is none left. Even in Bihar, we were told the other day, well, nobody plows with bullocks anymore. Okay, so they're gone for good. They've been substituted by tractors, just like the horses went. I grew up with horses on the farm plowing, and they went in the mid-50s. They were gone okay, because wages were rising. And I, myself, on our own farm, we went through a very painful adjustment uh, for adjusting to the rising farm wages. But we, be, we made it. And then uh, on, we're dealing with aggregate crop output. So each output is weighed by its price. And so the aggregate crop output price both includes the, the, the whatever diversification occurred as well as possibly changes in prices among the output. Yes. Microphone. Yes. The response, like every other thing is rising, like fertilizer prices rising, other thing rising. And there are some people argue that they're like other all other price fertilizer, other input price, other thing increase two, three times, product price increases. So so naturally the agriculture the, the wage also need to increase in a response so the otherwise the real income of the labor force will be declined sharply. So it is in a response to that also it is increasing. Yeah, but all this analysis is in real terms. Okay. So every in income increase we show, every wage growth is in real terms. So output price is increased by less than half relative to the agricultural wage and uh, less than about a fourth or a fifth relative to the non-ag wage. So, uh, so everything is done in real terms. Yes, Alphonse. Thank you. Uh, one of my questions is about your output supply demand equation. We find that the old elastic is positive. And I cannot, and you explain one of factors that explain this by the technical change. And I'm wondering if the, in your model you capture some scale, scale elasticity or scale change in, in this model. Now let's go back to the. Okay. Okay. The output price, of course, is a price index, and the output is also a price index, both Fisher indices. And, you know, we, we don't need a paper to prove that output supply elasticity with respect to its price is positive and with respect to its wage is negative. That's obvious, but we find it nicely confirmed, and these elasticity turn out to be almost the same as I estimated 25 years ago. What is particularly striking is that the uh, own elasticity of hired labor, family labor, fertilizer, and non-land capital are almost the same. So price change is hitting. So now, in terms of time, this is residual technical change after we or take the residual time trend after we account for everything else. Now, it's not sure that it's the, just the rate of technical change. There may also be a year effect hidden in here. Now, what are the shifters? Where did the, where did, uh, where are we getting some mileage? Uh, okay, we're getting mileage from the number of tractors, the share of HYVs, and the predicted lumber force. That's what gives us the mileage to compensate. Is that clear? Not clear? Okay.
which thank you very much for your very very touchy <coughs> seminar no still the answer remains elusive you raised a question very strong question it just uh, still it is unanswered you know that indian agriculture is dominated by small holders with the increase in the wage rate do you think that the competitiveness of uh, this one agriculture will remain already farmers are in agrarian crisis number of suicides and everything with even climate change and there are ceiling li limits to growth given the natural resource degradation scarcity of water and all that. so this wage increase uh, is the biggest this is the worst hit any is, is it what is your uh, this one How, no, okay. what is the answer but because you raised the question but still the answer remains elusive no, no you said that this one see that No, the, uh, how can indian agriculture cope with raising wages what is the coping mechanism here how the coping mechanism is investment mechanization and other investment there is a significant increase in livestock investment there is a significant increase in the other components of non land investment that's how they cope they invested and they got some breaks some lucky breaks the quality of the labor force went up and uh, and so on and so so it's uh, the quality of their own labor force went up tractorization added a bit these are all the factors which which account for 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 the thing these are the adjustment factors not each individual farmer that's what the stress can able is able to adjust it way but they did cope and remember the small holder farmers who sell more labor than they buy okay the really small one the ones who get hit at the larger farms and you see the period of suicides is very much conterminous with this period and it's not surprise output prices actually fell in real terms of state constant wages rose significantly the rate of technical change was down i mean so many factors came together to hurt agriculture during that period and that's what you see reflected to to some extent in the in the in the farmer suicides they had a tough time doing this but it looks like they're going to do they're doing better now okay. and then you see the The, the big point is this the big point is this the farmers gain, lost something they lost other things equal they lost some profits but other things are not equal okay so when the non farm wage rose that fast the small farmers started offering themselves in the non farm market and they they got a huge gain from that the larger farmers primarily opened new non farm businesses so that was a quite a difference in the pattern of how they cope and in spite of the fact that the wages rose in the aggregate they ended up having to hire more workers okay rather than a total reduction in the workforce during that in in the agricultural labor we still see a, 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 a some of us so those are the adjustment factors and the biggest one of them all is investment in non land assets now remember the last four years or the last eight years since six years since 1978 anyone traveling around rural india would have been surprised by the incredibly rapid pace of mechanization if you travel around india I, where was that where was i oh i was in the neighborhood of anand there were five or six lorries each loaded with five tractors which were running down the road you never would have seen anything like that uh, 10 or 15 years ago in addition 
harvest combines we have already discussed have come in almost everywhere where they can. And even the Bihari farmers on their tiny little farms are finding some ways to get around and using harvest combines. So those are the changes. They're monumental. Okay? This is exactly the changes which Swiss agriculture and most of European agriculture went through from 1949 to 1965. Okay? And you won't recognize your agriculture in 10 years. Okay? You won't recognize it. The interesting story about this is, uh, which is very different from what you see elsewhere. Your urban employment opportunities are growing slowly. Okay? Far too slow, especially for unskilled labor. So, so your rising labor force is not able to move to urban areas. It's still rising, and so the place where they find employment is in the rural non-farm sector. They're very lucky about that because that sector has been booming like crazy. Okay? So that's the story. Okay? If the rural non-farm sector hadn't boomed, they, might, they, they wouldn't have been able to go into non-farm sector, and they might not have been able to finance the investments. Okay? You have to think of... It's a general equilibrium system. Once major, there are two other hands, but uh, since this is related, I'd like to, to add a bit more by thanking Hans on asking the question, how did farmers deal with rising wages? And through his systems of equations and through his econometrics, he's able to systematically show which factors actually dealt and changed or drove the process hmm. bit by bit. And the whole story that got to me is that um, initially it was negative. In fact, that was the, the feedback given to us uh, by, by our investigators who are in the field t talking about these negative effects. But they were never quantified. But now your quantification says so, that explanation of the negative effects, but the explanation of the positive good results for both the farmers who were able to take advantage of non-farm sector and the landless workers who were able to take advantage of the fact that they replaced the labor they of replaced the some of the labor. But the question that I would like to add, and we have started discussing this with, with Hans, is the fact that when you look at the aggregate, you, you got these very pretty results. And I think pretty res more interesting results will come in when you start to ask particularly who, and that is introducing the youth. Is it the mobility of the youth and the highly educated who has more access to this non-farm no, well, We already know the answer. Yeah, we, we know that. We know but, the answer. But just to, to stimulate question. the discussion uh, by, by looking at age as a variable in this, in this uh, fact factor, we will be able to answer some of the questions of Nagaraj, uh, because you keep on asking this question on the role of youth in agriculture. Because most probably, this is a hypothesis that Hans says it's already answered, is that they are most likely the ones who would have more access, not only in the urban sector, but also in the rural non-farm sector. And the story goes that with that sector of the population investing back into agriculture, you know, you'll have then investments on machineries, investment on, on higher um, improved technologies, you know, you will have improved productivity and therefore higher output. So the, the story of the positive effect, you know, overwhelms the initial uh, qualitative negative effect that we've been talking about. I looked at, uh, saw two more hands, three more hands. Dr. Joda? I think uh, in spite of my limitation in terms of, as I used to call, uh, as Krishna used to call, we have two types of economics. One, Sairana economics in what we say poetry. India is a poor country. India is a poor country. It's just like poetry. poetry. Another economics is Jalebi Chha. Jalebi is a sweet system study into the ground. So I always put like that, and in spite of strong association with Hans, I could not learn that because it is simply written. So I didn't understand 
understand a lot of those things, but I think inferences wise, I think it is very good. And I have some additional points. One is that uh, I can't say how much in which area, but one thing is semi feudal or slightly richer farmers, they have moved to the farm itself. Women, children, everybody has moved to a small house in the farm, which has a lot of impacts in terms of finishing casual work or rather than throwing wastes here and there. So that is one that the total family of that of farmers has moved to. So I don't say explains everything I'm giving. Small instruments like first time one doctor ready in Erie, he developed this two wheeler with hand operated. Now you go to any village in different areas, that is for agricultural machine plus a transport thing. Once it goes with transport, then a lot of advantages are there. Similarly, people who now because of better urban, as you mentioned, roads, etc., people go and sell the milk, but in the process they bring a lot of things in terms of information, in terms of knowledge, etc. Et uh, similarly, uh, many of the large, uh, large herds of animals, that is on the decline because all commons are finished, so people have to manage with small properties. And women who go for weeding to other areas, they bring powder and things back home and the small ruminants are starved. And when they go for work, they take the milk for food or water. And uh, then, you know, the small thing which they never sold earlier, like vegetables and fruits. So when they go for work or earning ways, they would take this. So, you know, the, there are several less visible changes. Which can't have data on all of that, but then that explains how. Yeah, those are very wonderful uh, examples of how people adjust, and obviously they can be captured in an aggregative analysis, but that's what we have. Uh, for example, I've examined the microdata, okay, uh, of all of the farm classes in this data set, and I've written a paper about this. It's a very boring paper because it's mainly descriptive, but, uh, but every time I want to interpret something, I have to go back to the paper and how did this change and how did that change. Uh, okay. We one have more. one. Shalander, please. Uh, please use the mic, Shalander. As you said, uh, it was quite relieving, revealing, uh, many of the things you really brought out. But just I was uh, wondering that, uh, uh, as Dr. Jodha mentioned, that uh, especially the investment in terms of the public investment on roads, infrastructure, and also during this period, the watershed investments and also the credit uh, which flowed into, and then the communication, telecommunication, maybe many factors. This output is uh, not only uh, dependent on the wages, but there are many other things are happening other than the directly technology going to the field. Uh, so I don't know how far it is possible to bring in those uh, factors. And then another thing is that uh, the, as you said, that many of these small farmers are they are also going as a labor, especially after coming of Narega, uh, made this so much kind of democratic uh, labor market. Initially, these small farmers were not going for as a labor to the other fields, but after Narega, everybody was going to Narega. So that supported their investment in the agriculture. And all these factors is changing last 15 years. And uh, is it possible to do an analysis on holding size basis, maybe small farms, medium or large farms, they may be affected differently due to the wage rate changes? Oh, you, could, you could do it with this data. There is endless disaggregation possible, you know, yes, on Friday I presented a seminar 
where we use the disaggregated household data to distinguish between impacts on men and women and men. All of this is possible. Okay, so, so, and all of this is also possible with your data, the, the, the VDSA data. I wouldn't do this analysis with the VDSA data because it's already been done with microdata, but this is a very good piece of analysis for Bangladesh. Okay? They now have the data, they can start looking at that question. Okay. okay. One more question from the top. Looks like that's the last one. <coughs> You actually made a very good point, and which I didn't get, because I was puzzling about why did both family labor increase on the farms per hectare basis, when actually a lot of people went out to the non-farm sector. And I think it's clear, because during that period there was a lot of diversification into, uh, into other crops, which typically tend to be more labor intensive, and 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 animals are also labor intensive. You can do this analysis and break aggregate agricultural output down into livestock output, crop output, or uh, uh, horticulture output, and the rest of them. All of the data is there. You can break it down, then you can see the finer grain, but. I, you see, when you do an inquiry like that, if you want to go deeper down, be very sure that you know what your question is. Otherwise, you're going to get confused and estimate all kinds of things without really knowing why and very hard to interpret. Here, the question which I started out about five years ago was very clear. What can India do if wages are rising? What is the hit? In the now I want to make, uh, no, no, I forgot the point I wanted to make. All right. I thought that was um, Tom having the last question. We now would like to thank you, Hans, for this wonderful seminar.